Good morning, City Church. I want to welcome all of you that are here today. If you're here for the very first time, we just we give you a great big welcome home. We are so glad that you have joined us today. If you're watching online, we want to say thank you for watching online. If you could just shoot a little note on the message there to the tech team, let them know that you appreciate that. That would be great. Hey, uh, this morning, we will never forget. 9-11-2001, we will never forget. Every person in this room knows exactly where you were when you heard the news, you turned on the television set, and you couldn't believe it. You just couldn't believe what you were seeing today. That morning, 19 terrorists commandeered four commercial airlines and turned them into weapons of mass destruction. The feelings of terror, anger, sadness, disbelief, all rolled up into one inexplicable emotion that I pray I will never have to experience again. Although we'll never forget the, ev the events of that horrific day, we will not let the evil acts of others define us with the same hatred and murderous venom that they had towards us. We will never forget the sacrifices of those men and women, those first responders who rushed into the buildings to save the lives of others. We will never forget the unity of our nation as we came together, united under one flag, and declared, God bless America. We will never forget that freedom freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that is not cherished by all. We will never forget our commitment to pursue the God-given destiny that is given to each of us to bring his love to our city, community, nation, and world. Today on your way in, you saw a great big banner with some, some balloons, and it said, never forget. As a culture and as, also as a Christian community, we celebrate we celebrate life. We celebrate forgiveness. We celebrate hope that out of the ash heap of death and destruction, God always has resurrection. And today, we are here to honor our first, our first responders. We've invited first responders to this first service. And if you are a first responder in any capacity in our government, in our community, we'd like for you to stand at this time as we honor you. Can you stand at this time? Back here. Right back here. We want to say thank you. At this time, I'm going to have all the congregation stand, and I'm, invite, I'm inviting Mark James, fire, fire, firefighter, paramedic, and currently serving as a fire inspector for the city of Sanford. He's going to lead us as he sings the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets rang glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the whole James and I, we share the same lunch special place. 
we go to PDQ not too far from here, and we set together offer at lunch. And Mark, I want to personally thank thank you on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of the City Church family. Thank you for all that you do. We love you. We're proud of you. God bless you. I'm going to have you stand with me. I'm going to pray. We want to pray. We want to thank all of our first responders that are here today, but we also want to pray for you. It came out this morning, I think Lee mentioned to us that there were 127 others that were added to the wall, at the Memorial Wall there in, in New York City, that the first responders that have died as a result, of, not of going in, but of the consequences of breathing the air and the pollution and the toxics. We want to pray. Today, there's never been a day that's more, more dangerous, uh, more uncivil, more uncaring to those who've been called to serve and to protect us as a nation, and we want to pray for them today. And so let's do that. Will you join with me as I pray? Father, uh, we are humbled today by grace. Lord, as we watch the images play over again, it just strikes a chord in our heart to recognize for each of us how fragile life is. And that freedom, Lord, is something to be cherished and to be valued. I thank you for every first responder. I thank you for those, Lord, who, who have said yes to the call that they would protect. And, Lord, that they would serve their community and serve their fellow man. Lord, you said that we are to give honor to whom honor is due. And so today we honor our first responders. We first right here, Lord, have Mark that represents first responders here in Sanford and Seminole County and, and our community at large. And we th say thank you for them. God, we pray for the police officers, Father. We pray for those who, who serve, Lord, in the EMTs and the fire departments and the, and the emergency rooms. God, we just pray for them and their families tonight that, Lord, in this time that they would know that there are people that care, that there are people who are concerned, and that we desire to see good come to them because of their service to others. We thank you that for those who are willing to lay down their lives for their fellow man. You said what no greater act of love there is for a person to do this. We thank you for that call. We thank you, Lord Jesus, today for grace that's in this room. And, Lord, as we, as we uh, take this moment to honor our, our fellow friends, we say thank you for the work that they're doing. And, God, we ask that you will bless this nation. Once again, God bless America. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give the Lord a great big hand? God bless you one more time. You may be seated. past Easter, we took the survey, and uh, you asked for it. You asked for it. You asked uh, uh, the question, how do I pray? And so we have talked about prayer. You asked the question on how do I steward or manage my money? You asked the question, what's my purpose in life? Someone asked the question, lots of people asked the question, how do I deal with discouragement and anxiety? Uh, this morning, I'm going to deal with the topic of forgiveness. The question was, why should I forgive? I want to address that topic this morning. I want to talk about why we should forgive. But I want to even broaden that picture to beyond why we should do it. How can we live a life of forgiveness? How can we live a life of forgiveness? If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 6, and these are the words of Jesus. I want you to hear this this morning. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to read verses 14 and 15 through 16. And then we're going to look over at Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 13. And I want you to stand with me this morning as I read the Scriptures out loud. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse number 14. And Jesus said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I just want you to let that sink in just for a moment. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. I want us to look at verse number 13. Paul the Apostle said, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I want to talk to you this morning about living a life of forgiveness. You may be seated. This last Monday was Memorial Day. My wife and I took a little little trip up to the beach. We, we got a little spot that we've carved out in Ormond Beach, and, 
And so we went to the beach, and, and we were walking along the beach. And I love to do that. I love to walk along the beach. And we were walking along the beach, and there was a, a car coming towards us. And I saw the lady. I would actually saw her go the other direction. She must have turned around towards the Daytona side, and she was coming back. And, and as she was heading towards us, she got just a few feet past us, and she got stuck. Everyone say stuck. stuck. Come on, say with me. Say stuck. She was stuck, and I mean, you know, she was spinning the tires, and there were a couple of the guys walking along, and they started to try to push her, and I joined in, and, and the more we pushed, the more stuck she got, right? The harder we pushed, the more stuck she got. She was spinning her wheels, and, and then I saw this car. You see that little gray car right there, a little Mustang? It came along the outside, closer to the ocean. He thought, she, uh, this girl thought she was going to pass this car that was stuck and keep on going down the road. I want you to see the next person, next picture. One more picture there. She got stuck. stuck. Now, I knew she was going to get stuck because I had been walking on that sand. I had felt the softness of the sand. The only way you were getting through that sand is if you had a big truck or a four-wheel drive. And, you know, it's much like life. You can look at someone else and you can see their bitterness and you can see their anger and you can see their frustration and you listen to the way they're talking. You know that they are stuck. Stuck. You know it, right? But here's the reality. The reality for most of us, it's really easy to see it in others. It's not so easy to see it within ourselves. And so this morning, I want to talk to us about this. I want to talk to us about this life of forgiveness and what it really looks like. Well, in order for us to talk about forgiveness, we've got to define forgiveness. And sometimes the best way to define something is to say what it's not. What is forgiveness not? And so uh, the first thing I want you to hear this morning, that forgiveness is not minimizing or dismissing the seriousness of the offense. It's not minimizing or, or, or dismissing the seriousness of the event. As a matter of fact, when something significant happens and you just simply dismiss it, you know what you do? You actually cheapen that, that, uh, that event that took place. There are people today that even deny that 9-11 took place. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It's nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. We hear in a culture today people minimizing, trying to blame the United States for these 19 people that commandeer these airplanes and slammed them into, into our buildings. We, we don't minimize when something serious takes place. But here's the deal. We got to understand the difference between unintentional and intentional. We've got to understand that there are unintentional acts that wound people, and then there are, are intentional acts that, that wreck people or wreak havoc in people's lives. And they're completely different. You see, you can, you can look up here at me and you say, you know what, I think that guy looks funny. I think every pastor should be wearing a suit and tie on Sunday morning. And you come up to me after church and you can just say something kind of boorish, and you can say, you know, I don't really like the way you look. Now, I mean, that might wound me. You might say, you know, hey, you're too bald and the lights are shining too bright at the top of your head. And, you know, it might wound me. And we all do that. We all say things that are insensitive at times. We don't really mean anything about it. Sometimes we're just talking. And I find that when the mouth is, is engaged, usually nothing else is really working. And we're just talking along and we say, and all of a sudden you'll be, you know, you'll say something insensitive to someone and you'll see their countenance change and you didn't mean anything by it. But, you know, they were wounded by what you said. It happens in relationships and families all the time. I've been working really hard on practicing smiling. I've been working really hard because I realize that if I walk around the campus and I'm not smiling, people think I'm mad. And I'm not mad. I'm just living life. But I don't want to offend anybody. So everywhere I go, I work on smiling. I try to I practice my Joel Osteen every morning when I get up in the morning. And so you can be wounded by an insensitive comment, but it's really not that big of a deal. But there is a huge difference when someone wrongs you, when someone intentionally sets out to take advantage, to hurt, to abuse, to rip you off. When someone intentionally does it, that just doesn't wound your spirit. That really wreaks havoc in your spirit. You're wronged. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Well, first of all, you got to know the difference between unintentional and intentional. And what I've discovered in my life personally is that most things that happen to me are unintentional. Most things that happen to me are really no big deal. 
We used to have a pastor on staff here, and he would talk about things that people got offended over. I mean, really small things that people would get offended over. And he'd have a famous line. We use it around here 11 years later. If someone's really going on and on about something that's really insignificant, insignificant and small, he would say, you know what you need to do? You need to go to Lowe's. You need to get a ladder and get up on over it. And there's most things in your life. You just need to go to Lowe's, buy yourself a ladder, and climb up on over it. Because it's just not, in the scope of the world, in the scope of history, in the scope of really what's happening in your life, it's just not that big of a deal. But there are other things that wound us. There are other things that they're wrongly done to us, and they leave us extremely hurt. And the reason that you have to know the difference is because one of them is easily overlooked and you can keep in relationship. But the other one, the other one, when you are wronged and you are really hurt, you got to be smarter about moving forward in that relationship with that person. Uh, uh, let me just give an example here. Let's say you're in an abusive relationship. You're in a relationship where the other person is physically abusive or verbally abusive. They've done something really, really bad and wrong to you. And they come up to you and say, hey, I'm really sorry. Well, there's a big difference between being sorry and actually being repentant. So there's a huge difference. And so if, if you're going to be back in relationship, if you're going to move forward in relationship with, per, with a person who has wronged you, who's intentionally set out to hurt you, there's three things that's got to happen. One, there's got to be re real repentance. The word repentance means to change the way that you not only think, but to change the way that you act. There has to be true action. There's got to be true fruits of repentance. And then there's got to be some kind of restitution. Uh, I, I re when I first gave my life to Christ, I remember I felt so convicted by some of the things that I had done that I went back to the people that I had wronged and I tried to make restitution. And one of the ways that I know that I had truly repented and I was, I was sorry for my sins, for those that I had wronged, that I really wanted to make things right. And that's a sign that a person's heart has changed. And then here's the deal. Rebuilding trust takes time. Rebuilding trust in a relationship takes time, words, and action. Time, words, and action. Forgiveness is instant. That takes grace. Restoration is a process, and that takes time. Forgiveness is instant. When you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And to cleanse you from all wrongdoing. Forgiveness is instant in our life. Instant. And it takes grace to do it. Restoration is a process. And that takes time. A church leader falls. A politician falls. Someone that's, someone that's really done something egregious in culture. In a place of prominence. They can be instantly forgiven. But the process of restoration simply takes time. Uh, the second thing you got to know about forgiveness is, is that it isn't conditional. We don't say, I'll forgive you if. I'll forgive you if. The moment you put an if to it, you put a condition on it. And that's not what God does for us. God doesn't put a condition on our forgiveness. He says, if we confess, the moment we confess, His grace is available for us. Real forgiveness is unconditional. There's no if attached to it. Forgiveness is not based on a promise that I'll never do it again. Someone says, I'll never do it again, and they go do it again. And then they ask you for forgiveness again. What do you do? You say, well, don't, you know, shame me once, shame on you, shame me twice, shame on me. Is that what we say? But is that what Jesus said? No, 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 no. Jesus said, if someone shames you, offends you, hurts you 70 times seven in a day. I mean, in other words, we're to live a life of forgiveness. If someone is truly repentant and asked for forgiveness, we're to release them. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When we sin against God, many times we're not even aware that we're doing it. We're just living a human life, a human nature, especially before we come to Christ. But even after we come to Christ, at times we're sinning against God and we're not even aware of it. We're stuck in our cultural norms. We're stuck in our own certain way we're living, and we haven't been exposed to the truth of God's Word in a certain area of our life. And Jesus has already provided forgiveness. He didn't put a condition upon it. 47 years ago, 47 years ago, I got spanked unjustly. I still remember it. 
I still remember the unjust spanking in my life. As a matter of fact, my mom, I had two other sisters at, at, at that time. I have four sisters in total now. But at that time, I had two other sisters. And my mom lined all three of us up. And all three of us got an unjust spanking. You know why that was? Because one little girl in our church, she was a mean girl. She was a mean girl. She was a bad girl. She was a nasty girl. She went to my mom, something that she was actually doing herself. And she went and told my mom that we were doing it. Oh, my mom, she didn't even take time to find out if it was true or not. My mom, at that time of her life, she was a 25-year-old mom with three kids. She just lined us up and boom, 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 and off we went. Oh, I was so mad. It was an unjust. I will never forget that event. See, that's all my problems right now. All the problems that I have in my life are because of that event. You see, more important than forgiving is seeing what God can do with what happened. See, you're never going to forget. You're never going to forget what took place. The fact is, everything that happened in your life, God's allowed. I don't fully understand it. It wasn't designed by God. It wasn't meant by God. Listen, God doesn't condone evil. God judges evil. But God allows it to happen because he's created us to be free moral agents, to choose between life and to choose between death. Romans 8, 28 says, all things. Everyone say all things. You know this verse. You've been around the church. But here's the, here's the condition to the promise. All things work together for good for them that love God. For them that love God. If you're not loving God, if you're not putting God first in your life, all things might not necessarily work together for good in your life. See, all things work together for the believer. The stuff that's difficult, the stuff that's challenging. See, the fact is today, forgiveness isn't easy. Forgiveness isn't easy for me. Forgiveness isn't easy for you. Forgiveness is very difficult. Elizabeth O'Connor says, Despite a hundred sermons on forgiveness, we do not forgive easily, nor find ourselves easily forgiven. Forgiven. Forgiveness, we discover, is always harder than the sermons make it out to be. Forgiveness is always harder than the sermons make it out to be. It's why after Jesus told his disciples that they were to forgive 70 times 7, they said, oh God, Jesus, increase our faith. How do we do that? How do we forgive someone that just slaps us on one cheek and the other and the other? How do we keep forgiving? You can't do it without faith. You can't do it without having a heart changed by the power of the gospel. You know why it's difficult? It's difficult because the pain is real. The hardships, the emotions, the finances, the physical issues that took place as a response of what someone else did in your life, they're real. They're real. Someone said that all that time heals all wounds. Time heals all wounds. I say that's not true. The time only heals if we choose to live a life of forgiveness. And that takes grace through faith. Time only heals if we choose to live a life of forgiveness. So what is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is the act of pardoning offender. The Greek word translated forgiveness literally means to let it go. And, and as the Frozen movie said, let it go. Let it go. That's what it means. It literally means to let it go. I listened to this week to T.D. Jakes preach, let it go. We could have a little let it go service right now. Yeah, let it go. But that's not easy, you say. You're absolutely right. It's not easy. That's why you need Jesus. That's why you need to open your heart to the grace of God that's available to us every day. That's why the psalmist declared the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. So how do I know if I'm still harboring unforgiveness how do i know if i really haven't forgiven i got four tests first is the avoidance test you know the avoidance test is really simple you're walking down the grocery store and you see this person and and they're across the you know what i'm talking about they're like on the other side of the store and you're like yeah. and then you take your cart down the other way i know no one here has ever done that before it's the avoidance test you do whatever you can to avoid that person you avoid making eye contact. If you have to be in the same room, you won't look at them. You won't talk to them. I mean, you turn your other head. Uh, you turn your head the other way. You look down. You try to talk in the air. Pastor Glenn, I have this thing. It is the air clear test. 
You know what that means? It means you can actually look the person in the eye and have a conversation without it feeling tense at all. So the avoidance test. If you're avoiding people, if you're avoiding anyone, if you're really avoiding, there's something in your heart that you haven't released forgiveness towards that person. And then uh, the next is the accusation test. You find yourself blaming someone or others for a lot of the, if they wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be this way. If this wouldn't have happened in my life, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be having to go through this. We find ourselves accusing them, rightly or wrongly. You find yourself constantly speaking negatively about that other person, making yourself look good and making them look bad. You're accusing them. They're the devil incarnate. <laughs> Accusations. You know who the Bible says that the accuser, the accuser is Satan, and he accuses you and I before God. Uh, this, the third test is the agitated. I can be, I, I've, I've experienced this, and I know these, I wrote these down because this is what I've experienced in my life. But I'm just agitated. When I find myself, this is one of the barometers, whether I'm walking in, in forgiveness and peace, if I'm easily agitated. When I'm easily agitated and irritated and everybody's a dummy, <laughs> the pastor not make no sense today, boss didn't treat me right, that clerk took too long. I mean, whatever it is, you find yourself easily agitated. And the moment you hear a certain person's name, just something inside of you balls up. Mm. You're agitated. It just they make that person's name, the image of that person, it makes you agitated. You're carrying unforgiveness in your life. You see, most things in life just aren't that big of a deal. However, if you're, however, if you're walking in unforgiveness or living in hurt, almost everything's a big deal. Almost everything's a big deal. And then there's what I call the angry test. The angry test. And this is when we want to get vengeance. This is when we want to pay back. We find ourselves lashing out. We get into a conversation. This is quite common in a divorce situation. This is quite common when relationships spl split in a very complicated and difficult way. People are angry. They say vicious, mean things. And people do horrific, horrific things in that spirit of anger and unforgiveness. So why must, I, why must I walk in forgiveness? So you ask the question, why? I want to give you a couple of principles of why you should walk in forgiveness. And then I'm going to talk to us how we can do it. Why must I forgive? Number one, because God has forgiven you. It's really simple. Colossians 3, 3, 13. Remember, the Lord forgave you. Did you deserve God forgiving you? Did you deserve that? No. You were a sinner. You were a rascal. You were, you were bad. Whether you believe it or not, the nature of your life was sinful, and you were at wrath. You were, you were, you were just angry at God, whether you knew it or not. Your whole life was turned against him. The Bible says the wrath of God is being poured out on the ungodliness and the wickedness of the world. If you've not experienced a relationship with Jesus, you find yourself under the wrath of God. You're walking in unforgiveness. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. The Lord forgave you. You must forgive others. See, Christianity is supremely a religion of forgiveness. It begins with God who forgave us and it comes down to us and God's forgiveness is released to us. Then we in turn are to release, to be the bearers, to be the reconciliation of, of Christ in this world as we forgive other people. The Bible says this is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. We've all sinned against other people. We've all sinned against other people. We've all hurt other people. We've all, we've, we've all fallen short. We've all done wrong to other per people. Not a person in this room. But the way that we're able to hang on to unforgiveness is that we make ourselves superior to the other person. The only way that you can really hang on to unforgiveness in your life is you actually place yourself above that person. It's the only way you can do it. You're driving down the road, and you got road rage. That guy's a jerk. That guy doesn't know how to drive. You drive by, it's everything in your power to keep from giving him the middle finger. That person, you are far superior. To, you would never ride up on somebody's tail. You would never drive and text. You would never make a wrong turn. You would never do it wrong. You are a superior driver. I'm king of the road. 
You got your pedal to the metal. Get out of the way. Right? You're superior. Now, the fact is you're a jerk. <laughs> you're just a jerk. Plain old, plain. You see, you've, at that moment, you've made yourself superior. You're not superior. All of us come to Jesus the same way. All of us come to Jesus as a sinner in need of salvation and of his grace and of his mercy. The second reason is because God, because unforgiveness hurts me. It hurts you. You can hold on to this and you can stew on it and you can walk out of this service not changed. The fact is today you hold on to unforgiveness in any way in your life. It hurts you three ways. It hurts you physically. There are all kinds of studies. John Hopkins did a study on, on unforgiveness and the physical body. I mean, there's so many statistics on, on heart, uh, blood pressure, on heart disease, on cancer, all kinds of diseases and, that are a direct result of people not able to let it go. People who are walking in forgiveness. I read a story of a young man. He was an African-American young man when he was about 20 years ago in his university. He was tormented. Him and another guy were tormented and they were harassed and they were thrown off their floor because of the color of their skin. And he talked about how over the next couple of years, he got himself so full of bitterness and anger. He found himself in the hospital. He was like, God, why did they do that? Why did this happen? He was so angry and so mad. And there he lay in the hospital, literally almost on his deathbed. And another brother from his church came into him and began to pray that God would heal his body and release that hurt. And the moment that that man prayed, he said it was just like water came washing over my soul. He said, it just washed me and it cleansed me. He said, in that moment, I released forgiveness towards those boys. He said, and when I did that, he said, in the next day, I walked up out of that hospital, I was healed. <laughs> so many physical ailments in our life. Oh, I don't, oh, you just Google it. You Google it for yourself. Hashtag Google. So many things in our life. There you go. It's a result of us holding on to unforgiveness. It harms us physically. Job says, you are only hurting yourself with your anger. It hurts me relationally. Hebrews chapter 12 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You see, when we're holding on to hurt and unforgiveness, it's impossible to keep it just inside. It always spews out. It spews out in our kids. It spews out in our marriage. It spews out in our relationship with our coworkers. It spews out in our family. We hold on to this, and, and boy, it just starts overflowing. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you're speaking that anger. It hurts your relationships. And ultimately, it hurts you spiritually. If you don't forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. That's a big deal. So many people in our culture... So many people, one of our very close friends, his older brother, is facing 10 years in prison. It just happened in the last two weeks. Uh, this, this young man, he's in his early 30s. He was abused. He was mistreated. Life wasn't fair. He's a big guy. He's six foot four, 325 pounds. He could bench 400 pounds, and he's mean. He loves to fight. He's so full of anger. He's the, he's the biggest economy of just about anybody I can know. And one moment, he can be the gentle, kindest person, and the next moment, he can be in a fit of rays. In a drunken moment, he grabbed his grandmother by the throat, and he threw up against the wall. Then he went out to the car, and he smashed their cars and their doors, and, and setting inside of him was all this unforgiveness. It's my dad's fault. He divorced my mom. It's my grandparents. It's the culture's fault. It's the court's fault. The judge came into the room this last week. They were all told to rise, and he refused to rise. See, that's a man that's carrying the ultimate of anger. But guys, we turn the newspaper, newspapers open. We flip open our phones. We see it on the television. that there is murders as a direct result of bitterness and unforgiveness by the thousands in our culture every single day. The fact is, is each of us is going to need more forgiveness in the future. Every person in this room, the reason that we need to give forgiveness is because we're going to need forgiveness for ourselves. So how do I do it? How do I forgive? First of all, 
Repay evil with good. Repay evil with good. I love 1 Peter chapter 3. You should read it for yourself. It says, if you want to see life in good days, refrain your tongue from speaking evil. And then Peter says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Come on, pay them back with a blessing. When people set out to harm you, when people set out to abuse you, Jesus said we were to pray for our enemies. We were to bless those who curse us. This is exactly opposite to everything you feel like doing. Your human nature does not want to bless when someone curses. When someone gives you the finger in traffic, your first response, your first response isn't to want to say, I bless you. <laughs> I'm standing on my patio just Friday night. Stand on my patio, and I see a guy come up, and he gets his little boy. I, I, from my understanding, there's some kind of relational issue with the mom and dad, and the dad comes pulling up, and he's one of these big muscle guys, and he's got a big truck, and he comes up and gets his boy, and, and he walks out to his truck, and when he opens the door, the beer bottle falls, smashes right on the concrete, right in front of my house. He gets up in his truck, and he looks at it, and he just smirks, and then he drives off on down the road. My first thought wasn't blessing. <laughs> I was mad. I said, are you kidding me? How could you do that? And I, I had this moment. I had to make a decision. Because he had, he had to get out of the neighborhood still. I could have run down. I could have picked up some glass. I could have thrown it in his truck, which I felt like doing. <laughs> Wisdom got a hold of me. He was way bigger than me. Probably would have hit me. But I thought, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going I'm to go pick it up and throw it on his wife's front door. That's my first thought, right? We're human. I had a choice to make. And in that moment, I chose to bless. I had this thought, what would Jesus do? Well, I mean, really, what in that moment? Would he make a big deal about it? Is this one of those go to Lowe's and get a ladder and get on over it? For me in that moment, absolutely. I went to the garage. I got a broom. I got the little dustpan. I went out there. I swept it up. And I was so tempted to walk over to their front door and just sit around the front door. But that's not what I did. I just went into the garage. I put it in the garbage can and I walked away. I thought, well, this is going to be a really good illustration for Sunday morning. <laughs> we, don't pay, we don't repay evil with evil. We repay evil with good. I never brought it up. I'm never going to talk to the family again. No one ever saw it but me and God. And now you. We repay evil with good. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. That was good. Make forgiveness a way of life. And Peter asks, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times. No, Jesus replied, 70 times seven. This is where God is calling us today. Make forgiveness a way of life. And practice it in small ways. We went to Jimmy John's last night. They promised one minute little rap thing. One minute, one minute sub. 15 minutes later, let it go. Practice it in the small things. There you go. Let it go. You're in the checkout line and that guy really wants to get ahead of you. Let it go. I mean, you have to start. It's never going to happen in the big things. Instead, you start practicing it in the small things. And the way that you practice it in the small things is you don't have to get justice on everything in your life. You don't have to wrong, you don't have to right every wrong. You have to let it go. Pray for those who have hurt you. Pray for those who have hurt you. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. The way that people know that we're truly Christ followers, the way that we influence our culture and society is not yelling a bunch of words. It's not standing in the pulpit and screaming at people. No, it's not getting a megaphone on the street. Turn a bird. And I'm not saying there's never a place for that. But you know what impacts people? When you're in the job and your boss rips you a new one and you don't get up in your spirit and get back at them. You don't turn around from that course of events and, and start talking to your coworker about what kind of jerk he was. No, when you start to pray for them and you start to bless them, that's how people know that Jesus is in you. 2000, in 1992, my wife had, had just spent, and I had just spent three years in the inner city of Seattle, and we planted a church with another couple. And the church had exploded in growth. The church, 
the city of Seattle at that time, man, the inner city was ravaged with crack, and we were going after the kids, and we were going after the homeless, and we were reaching people for Christ, and it was an amazing experience. And the other couple that we had started with, the guy, myself and this guy, we started off as best friends. But after three years, man, it was very painful. It was extremely painful. And we came to an impasse when I had to leave that ministry. I had so many things in my mind. I had such anger, such unforgiveness. I was so mad. All the things. And I would rehearse them and I would replay them of what he did and how he did it. It made me so mad. And after I left there, I felt this block in my relationship. I knew I had to get over it. I knew I had to release. I just didn't know how. And every Saturday night, the church that we had just started attending, it was in our neighborhood, it was another Assembly of God church, we, we started attending, every Saturday I'd go up there and I would pray for one hour. And almost all my prayer was focused on God, help me to forgive him. I didn't pray one week, I didn't pray two weeks, I didn't pray three weeks, I didn't pray four weeks, I didn't pray, I prayed, I prayed daily besides going up to the church and praying. God, release this hurt. And I, I just could keep going back, every time I'd have a thought, I'd say, God, I pray for him. God, I and I'd hear something he'd do. It was so stupid. It would make me mad. I had to start praying and start praying and praying. And I prayed for months and months and months and months. After about five months, I finally left. The, I just felt it lift. I felt that burden lift. It was that very month. Up to that point, I had no direction in my life where I was going to go, what I was going to do. When I felt that burden lift, when I really felt like I was praying blessing over this person, the pastor of that church came up to me and said, Eugene, how would you like to be the executive pastor here at our church? I had no intention of going on staff. I was going to go. I was a church planner. I was going to go plan the church. And it was in that moment I know that when that forgiveness had been released in my life, God had opened a door for my next step. Why should you forgive today? Why should you forgive? And how do you do it? you got to continue to pray. Pray until the burden's lifted. Don't stop praying. Keep, keep praying. And here's the bottom, here's the, here's the bottom line. When forgiveness is released in our lives, we can tell the good news of God's forgiveness. Through Christ, God made peace between us and himself. God gave us the work of telling everyone about the peace we can have with him. And he gave us this message of peace. And we have been, sp we have been sent to speak for Christ. You know, if I never would have released that forgiveness at that point. See, because God, God was working in my heart. I was a, I was, I was a six-year-old boy when the first time that I was really beat by my father. I had experienced many beatings as a young boy growing up and as a teenager, lots of fights and there was a lot of hurt. And for 12 years of my life, I was trapped in the prison of unforgiveness, completely trapped. When I was trapped in unforgiveness, it led to addictions, it led to anger, it led to all kinds of abuse, not just to, to me, but to other people. You know why? because I held on to unforgiveness in my heart. But then God came. Mercy rewrote my life. And I can tell you today, no matter what you've walked through, I can tell you, no matter how hard you think it is, the forgiveness of God is available for you. But it's not only available for you, it's available for you to give to other people. You see, we can't be forgiven until we forgive. We can't be forgiven until we forgive. And today there's someone in this room. There's a lot of movement in this service today. A lot of people moving, a lot of, a lot of stirring. You know what that tells me? It tells me the Holy Spirit is speaking right now. There's people in this room. Man, there's some small things, and you're getting over it, that's, but there's some things that you've been holding on to. A person's name comes up, a situation comes up, and you find yourself rehearsing, and you're frustrated, and you're agitated. God's speaking to you. Let it go. Let it go. I want you to close your eyes. So what do I do today? What do I do today? You will never forget, but you can choose to live a life of forgiveness. You can choose. First of all, if you've met, never made the decision to follow Christ, that's your first step. Your first step is to experience the forgiveness and the grace of God. And that's not difficult. That's simply acknowledging Christ as your Savior. That's simply asking Christ to forgive you of your sins. That's simply with your own mouth confessing that Christ is your Lord today. It's that simple. It's not complicated. 
There's not a lot of, there's no ifs to it. There's no work to it. It's simply saying, God, I ask you to forgive me. And I receive that today because of what Jesus did for me on Calvary. It's that simple. God, I confess today that I need you to become the Lord of my life and to forgive me. And the Bible says the moment we do that, he forgives us. That's the first step. That's the first step. But so what do I do? I'm a believer today. First service, most people in this room are probably Christ followers. So what do I do? The first thing you do is you pray. You pray the very words of Jesus. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You said, I did, I've said that. You got to say it again. You got to say that until it becomes real in your heart. It becomes real in your spirit. You're here today. You know you're holding on. There's, some, there's, a, there's an agitation. There's something in your life that you know you haven't let go. And God's speaking to you today. When I count to three, there's no one looking. I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Come on, in this room right now. Anyone in this room? All across this room. I want everyone to stand this morning. You have this little card. It looks something like this. We call it a connect card. And on one side is a place for you to fill out your name. You don't want to fill out your name today. You, can, you don't have to do that, but we'd encourage you to do that if you're new here to City Church. But on the, back step, on the back side, it says, my next step is I'm committing my life to Christ. I'm renewing my commitment to Christ. I want to be water baptized. I'm attending growth track. I want to be part of a small group. My next step is, and there's a blank. I want you to fill in that blank. My next step today is to release forgiveness. My next today, step today is to release forgiveness. And I want you to put that person's name there. I just want you to write that person's name today. I want you to do that this morning. And then we're going to take this card. I want you, if you need to do that right now, take this card. Don't wait. Take the card because you can fill it afterwards. And the, the ushers are going to come by in just a few minutes. And you can drop it in there. But I want everyone this morning, I want you to place your hand like this. I'm going to give you just a minute to grab a card. I want everyone to say this prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord Jesus, today, help me, by grace, through faith, release my agitation, release my anger, and to forgive this person who's hurt me, who's wronged me. Jesus, in your mighty name, amen.